it's not in tune at all. So there you go. That's all the music that happens in this podcast. I think that uh, there's going to be a few people watching this who are death therapy fans who don't necessarily know very much about BTA. And so they definitely don't know very much about Seth Hecox or how Jason knows Seth Hecox. So yeah. I thought maybe the first thing we could do is talk about how we met each other, which um, you have a much better, we, I think we've discussed this before, you have a much better long-term memory of details. I have a much more like, like immediate overanalyze every detail memory, um, which works out, which works out okay for songwriting, but not so good for remembering when things happened on the road and, uh, or stuff. So, um, I remember that we met in college, but I don't remember what year it was. I don't remember, um, what was it your freshman year? Yeah, I actually, okay. So how truthful do you want me to be? Cause it may not be super flattering for, uh, <laughs> the way my memory remembers okay it doesn't bother so my me memory, okay okay so at troop mcconnell college uh mm -hmm. fall of 2003 that's my freshman year it's your sophomore year because you graduated in 02 i graduated in 03 mm -hmm. uh i had made some friends right off the bat ben hamilton and patrick and kai and some of those other guys ruben so we were at the lunchroom table about maybe a month or two in and uh I saw you over there uh, sitting at a table and I recognized you from going to see, I think I saw the remnant twice. Uh, uh, was it at Penny, know. Penny, you in Gainesville? One was at Penny. You. The other one was down at some, some uh, like a cool hand Luke show in like Douglasville or something. Totally. Like that. That, I think it was actually in Snellville. Yeah, that might be it. So, so but I don't remember details. So <laughs> that's a but pretty I, good detail. I do. I do think we played, I do think we played as the remnant uh with wes still playing bass guitar opening for cool hand luke at snellville first baptist church um yeah. which oddly enough was a was a place that demon hunter came with extol and um, the agony scene on that tour and it's just so weird to think that there were used to be well we can talk about this later but there used to be these like random first baptist churches that these amazing metal shows would show up because nowadays that's like doesn't happen so no right yeah that was that was kind of like that unique niche in time where that could happen uh yeah i do remember that yeah because you were you were just doing vocals in and when i saw you at penny U, you you would i guess you just started playing bass i had already so, mastered the bass by that time <laughs> you're one month in and you were like soloing yeah. all over the place mm -hmm. um so yeah i recognized you and i was like oh i think that's the guy from that hardcore band so then we went and introduced ourselves and that's when we became friends. But in my memory, the reason I did that is because you were sitting by yourself at the lunch room table. That's why I said, so, so like I was the freshman, like the, the awkward homeschool kid who's just uh, mingling with other non-homeschool kids for the first time. And I, and I luckily had all these other dweeby friends who I think were also probably homeschool kids. <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking of, speaking of, speaking of dweeby, uh, I specifically remember that when we met, you did not style yourself as the metal guy uh, at the time, even though you listened to some metal, you were, you were very intent to tell me about your other friend whose name was Sean, who would be coming to true it. He wasn't there yet. And Sean was like, he was like the encyclopedia of metal was how he was pitched to me, which yeah. couldn't be, which couldn't be more hilarious now. Um, you know, all these years later that we've become, you know, like long-term <laughs> friends and, um, yeah sean's sean's great um but at the time sean had like ultra long hair and he was basically like everything sean does he puts himself 100 percent into it whether it's pokemon or uh metal or <laughs> video games or whatever um and at the time it was metal so basically if you needed information about a random metal band sean knew it so so anyway and then i guess we uh we were in choir together mm -hmm. right yeah so and you became that, a guitar major too at that time. So you and I played uh, classical guitar together, which is ridiculous to believe that I ever, that I ever. Hold on. Can I tell a story about that? Actually, okay. Sure. Sure. So, after one year of you and I both being in choir, we did the summer after my freshman year of college went to Wales and England on True. that choir trip. 
and we stayed with this Welsh guy named Andrew Andrew and um you got a classical guitar from him that was like the cheapest like most beat up thing that he wasn't going to use and you brought it back in a trash bag would you like <laughs> would you like me to go get it it's in the other room <laughs> And like, you use that to go, you were like, I should just, I should just be a classical guitar major. And so you did it. And you did a my, that. Yeah. My kids, my kids still play that thing. And it's the, the tuning pegs on like three of the tuners have broken off because <laughs> it's a classical guitar. So, and what I, I don't mean like the whole tuning peg, the string still holds on there, but like the little uh, plastic ivory or whatever thing that in, on a good guitar, it's made of ivory. On this one, it's plastic. <laughs> has crumbled off. So you, if you want to tune it, you have to get a little vice grips and, and tune each string. I, I'm glad to let you know that that guitar has not gotten any better since <laughs> since I got it in Wales and brought it home oh. in a trash bag. Oh that yeah, my, was, here. Was hold on, stuff. hold on. My wife is handing it in the door. Oh no! Oh man! Here it comes. Here it comes. There it is. And you know what? On, on video, it probably just looks like any other classic guitar. So yeah, classical basic. guitar. It's not in <laughs> tune at all. So there you go. That's all the music that happens in this podcast. <laughs> <clears throat> Man, that was, I and mean, we did. So we played a little bit in there uh, together on classical. And that was right around the time that uh, uh, the label was sending out uh you know, contract negotiation stuff during that semester. Right. And we signed at the end of the semester. Was that 2004? Yep. Late 2004. Okay. I, you know, I, I've wrestled in my mind. I can't remember if it was November or December, but I want to say it was December 2004. Then you showed me a song that you were working on and that song became Elegy on mm -hmm. the first Becoming the Archetype record. It was like, basically, uh, I wanted that song to be part of my band. So I asked you to join the band. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it was like, well, if, if I want this song, I mean, he's going to have to come with it. So and and I showed you on classical guitar. Speaking of that, it was in our dorm room. And I mean, if a riff is that True. good that it can sound OK on classical, then I guess that, that's pretty decent. riff. <laughs> yeah. Once you put some electricity in it, then it'll work. So <laughs> cool. Uh, yeah. So that's how we met. And that's how touring and stuff, you know, began was, I guess, February of 05. Is that yeah, what you're February saying? Of 05. Mm -hmm. February of 05. February of 05. Was that when we went out with, uh, did we go out with Showbread then? Yeah, Showbread and The Showdown and uh, Mortal Treason. And then the opening band on the first half was Point Zero, which became yes. War of Ages before they signed a strike first. Totally, totally. War of Ages, a.k.a. Point Zero. Man, um, I have some sick stories I can tell from that tour if you want to as well. But I, I turned 20 on that tour. We left when I was 19 on tour. Well, I thought that I actually thought that would be a great segue because that does lead into some interesting tour stories. And I think almost all of those tour stories, at least for me, can be summed up in saying that I was not there to party. I was <laughs> I was definitely there to prove the, to the world that we were the best metal band and yeah. the other bands were there to party and uh, to make you know, I mean, in, in hindsight, I've even talked to some of the guys in from the showdown or um, from those, you know, the other bands you've showbred and said, like, man, I'm so embarrassed at how uptight I was at that point. I can't speak for anyone else in the band, but well, we uh, all were. Yeah. <laughs> and it definitely did not develop uh, the like, oh, yeah, these guys are good hangs reputation. I don't think early on for the band, we were just like, OK, well. You know, we need to practice and more and rehearse and go to bed early and be better than everyone at music. And <laughs> Yes, that is definitely the attitude we had, you know, both in the songwriting. We wanted to play the hardest stuff that we could. We wanted to write mm -hmm. the most difficult things we were capable of playing. And and we really did think of ourselves, I think, as better and and not as better people, but maybe better musicians or better metal band. And that. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that doesn't go over well when you hang out with other bands. <laughs> so, so for me, one of the most embarrassing things I remember was, and you could, I need this is where I need your memory to help me remember how how this actually went down. Uh, we had a spark plug issue and um, some backfiring or something, and 
we were supposed to be heading to a show and we just didn't know what was going wrong with our vehicle. And we went to a shop and got it looked at and we paid some amount of money for something. And it turned out it was just a, like a firecracker or something that uh, one of the guys from the showdown had put on our spark plug. Yeah, we, um, we had, it was not running smoothly and we didn't know what was going on uh, okay. and it was misfiring. And, and then like halfway to the hotel, then all of a sudden a, a bottle rocket like shoots out from under the van out into the field beside <laughs> us. And we were like, are they shooting at us while we're driving? And then we, yeah. So the next day we took it to a thing and we found out, yeah, they had tied it to the thing. So that when the spark came through, it set off the bottle rocket and they, they thought it would happen like right when we start the car and then they would tell us and they could put the radio or the uh, spark plug cap back on, but it didn't happen right away. So they weren't sure what to do. So then we were pissed because we paid like 200 bucks and we didn't have right. any money. And I can remember, I can remember like, I mean, so you talked, you said you turned 20 on that tour. So, I mean, I wasn't much older. Um, I'm not that much older than you. So it's just hilarious to me to think that at the time, you know, I felt like I needed to sit, I needed to sit down with Josh from the showdown and explain to him that they were responsible and that they needed to pay for the, to the, which of course they did not. Um, right. It's just the most ridiculous demand ever. And in hindsight, I'd just be like, whatever. Uh, but uh, yeah, at the time we were trying to make enough money to get gas. So yeah, uh, I think, I think you like went to talk to one of them and they walked past you. You were like, Hey, we need to talk about this thing you did to our van. And they like, just, just kept walking and didn't even listen. Yeah. And I tried the same thing and it, the same thing happened to me. I think they were just like, these guys are tools. Yeah. And what, what, what's, what's kind of funny about that is, um, they're such, so I hope anyone who hears this will know this. Like they're such cool guys that actually we, we got along with them really well in the future. Uh, there were other bands that we just never clicked with. And somehow this band that was giving us such a hard time and we were giving them like the most ridiculous, like almost like an episode of the office reaction to the jokes they were trying. You know what I mean? Like they were Jim playing yeah, pranks and we on, were Dwight. on Dwight and we were Dwight a hundred percent. We were Dwight yeah. and they didn't stop being friends with us, which is really, really good. And I don't know, I don't know if they, uh, if they knew that that was going to happen. But so I remember that. Um, I remember, um, I remember confetti in the van. Yep. That was the same tour, right? We left our, our van window open. And mm -hmm. I think the, sh I think showbread did that to us. Confetti was that showbread? That, yeah. Confetti and everything is all over the van. What's so funny about this is I, we got, I feel like we got it all at one time. There yeah, was, all the pranks happened on the first tour. Nothing. Yeah. We never like did pranks after that. Nobody hazed us after that. But I guess, I guess that's one of those things that if if you know that, oh, it's our first tour, and you know after this, people will realize that we, you know, we've been there and they won't haze us so much. We probably would have taken it a little more uh, in step. But I think it was just like, what is going on? All right, so um. I guess after the show, after that showbread tour, which they call showbread famously, we get on stage every night and announce that it was the ultra metal tour plus showbread, right? So it was like all of these metal bands, like Mortal Treason. Um, and I feel like, I feel like uh, the guys in Mortal Treason got along with us really well too. Was it, was yeah. it Adam from Mortal Treason used to come up and do a song with us, um, which is so yeah. funny to think about because that song didn't actually make it onto any becoming the archetype uh recordings but he would come up and do that one which was from the old recording at the time all we had was the the remnant album yeah when we were yeah. on, on that tour so if you're one of the people that are out there and you bought the remnant album then lucky you i don't i don't actually have a copy i don't know i don't know if you do but you weren't on that record so no i wasn't so i had to sign jacob's picture and draw fangs on him <laughs> yes that's great <laughs> So, um, so I was thinking we could talk about just, you know, obviously that's the first tour and there's some really good stories from that. Uh, I mean, do you have any others that are non prank stories from that, that you th were thinking of telling before no, we move on I to mean, another one? We did, we did, we were learning how to get, you know, this is normal band stuff. We were learning how to get along with each other and we did. Okay. We're okay. First of all, we're using a Rand McNally Atlas to find our way into the right. city. And then like, I think one of us had a cell phone and we would call the promoter and be like, well, we're in Little Rock. How do we get to 
the venue and they I don't know that directions. I don't know that we had that either. I remember stopping at a lot of pay phones and stuff. Um, <laughs> but we're, we're we're okay. We're we're in Little Rock uh, now. Where we, yeah, we, is absurd. We really did. But yeah, I mean, it was crazy. So you you reminded me of something. So this is something that people will probably this totally speaks to the Dwight Schrute thing um, that we had going on, which is that we played maybe the first two or three shows and we were playing what like a 40 minute set and <laughs> as the opening as band. as the op- as the opening <laughs> band and showbread pulled us aside and said you absolutely cannot do this and it was like a week into the tour a three week tour the weekend and tour they pull us aside and say like no 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 okay so weekend their manager first pulled us aside That's right. in nashville do you remember that Yes. And he's like, man, you know, you guys are opening the band. Really, you should be like 20, maybe 25 minutes out of the four bands, you know. And I guess like one of us couldn't believe it. So we asked one of the guys in Showbread who just didn't want to like deal with that. So he's like, I don't know what he said, man. Don't don't worry about it. So I think we just kept playing 40 minutes. Oh, we we 100% kept playing the same set. And so I, I do think at some point, one of the Showbread guys did also talk to us and be like, yeah, so what our manager said is kind of right. Like you really shouldn't be playing 40 minutes. And I don't, maybe we still played. I don't, maybe we cut a song. No, we did. We cut it down after that, but I think we had to be told twice is the point. (laughs) We had to be told twice something that now, if I was taking a band out on tour, I would just, I would cringe so hard. Like if I see an opening band on any show play more than like five tunes, I just okay. So there's a crazy. few things about that. Number one, our songs were longer, which we held up with pride. So we we're playing True. things like. I think we played like six songs actually. Yeah, and and they were like five to six minutes each. So right. there you go. Um, but the thing is, you know, uh, this also speaks to the time that it was. Now, a label like Solid State or Tooth and Nail or any of those labels wouldn't probably sign anyone who had literally like no tour savvy, even if it's a band who's primarily online. Mm-hmm. They would have some instincts about those things. We happened to sign at a time where like, you know, the remnant hadn't gone on like tours, you know, like maybe a show here or there, but not tours. So we had to figure that out after we were signed and we were, we we're doing with other signed bands. And that was, that was the we beauty of the corners. That's the beauty of the cornerstone illusion was that we were able to present this illusion in 2004 or whatever it was cornerstone when ryan and yogi and the guys from demon hunter saw us it's like it creates the illusion that oh well they travel and they have gear and they they get on stage and they play um are you are you i'm sure that i've told the story at some point in the van but are you aware that that was the only show where i had absolutely no voice was that yeah you didn't have any vocals yeah it was just based on the riffs and they were like cool riffs man (laughs) let's and let's and let's be honest there's a good sermon in that, that, you know, (laughs) thou shalt have good riffs and humble thy vocals. Um, (laughs) um, I mean, we did, we, that was another thing we prided ourselves on though. And I think probably still do like where we think uh, music should be first and foremost and the vocals, like the music can't stand on its own without vocals and it's not good music and you should write something better. Right. Uh, Totally. And I, I think that was probably a good, I mean, I still, even in pop music, I would kind of, you know, I think about like a Death Cab for Cutie song or a Beck song. Like if there were no vocals, like this is still a solid song, you know, like there's, there's still melodies going on here, you know, it's decent. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Um, but yeah, so definitely we were newbies on that tour and um, I could, I think we could fast forward to. How many tours were we in when we got the school bus? That wasn't very long. Um, I didn't I think, think so. The, it was like 2006 or seven. No, no, no. It was 2005. We lost it in 2005. We only had oh, the really? school bus for like three tours. So, yes, yeah, so our second tour is Extol and the Showdown. And we were still in Ducks Van and the Loaf. Then we recorded yep. in Seattle. And then I think we got the tour bus right after that, the school bus, and trans, you know, built the bunks and everything. Right. Because Sean, Sean was helping build a lot of that. Sean Cunningham. Yep. One of the, yep, uh, the Sean ultimately should have credit as the original guitar player. Um, oh, cause he, he actually, he actually, and duck were the only ones at one point, um, oh, in duck's basement. There so there you go. But, uh, so yeah. Okay. Now that makes sense. That's 2005. I was telling somebody about this the other day because 
Parkway Drive is now one of the biggest bands in music, like heavy music. Like they they play arenas and they headline like Bach and Open Air and stuff. Like they're they're absolutely enormous. And um, I think the last time they came to the U.S., they headlined over Kill Switch Engage, which is just crazy wow. to, to me. But um, and people could fact check me if I'm wrong. But they were on the tour with Kill Switch Engage and Anthrax, and they were at the top of the bill. Um, but in 2005, it was the agony scene and Demiricus and us and Parkway Drive, right? Or was it, was it, our, was it, was it, okay, I'm getting, well, I, I definitely remember that Parkway Drive was on the, they were agony on the scene. HIMSA tour. I think it was HIMSA that they were on. Was that the one? Yeah, I think it was, so it was, it was after agony. No, it was before agony scene. Okay. Man, now I'm getting them mixed up. I, so on the on the agony scene tours, when our bus broke down in Colorado in, in November of 2005, and we rented a U-Haul from Denver and drove 24 hours from Denver to Atlanta, uh, three of us. You're leaving the out the, the you're leaving out the fact that we left the largest piece of litter in Denver that we possibly on the side of the highway. On the side of the highway. I don't know how the environmentalist in you feels about that now, but we <laughs> left a gigantic school bus, and we I think we threw dumbbells through the windows yep. to, bust, to bust the windows out because of, of course why not that was the closest but, that was the closest to being motley crew that we could come up with as christian kids <laughs> they never built us though I, I still think back about the fact that like the colorado department of transportation never likes because it was registered to our name they never sent us a bill like we had to remove this with a huge tow truck <laughs> like i, I don't feel, know i feel like i may just edit this part out so they don't hear about it no, I'm just... <laughs> okay that's fine I'm just uh, kidding. I'm kidding. So, so on that, so that was the Agony Scene tour, and I think Nodes of Ranvier was on that tour, and maybe one other band. But that that which was, one? Those, what tour was? Which tour was Arsis on, or was that an even separate tour? That was separate. So that was 2006 with Alex, and I think so. Arsis and Demiricus were the same tour. That was the okay, East okay. from the East tour, and we headlined that with Alex in 2006. In fact, I think Alethea might have been on that. I want to say the Parkway Drive one was the Himsa one, which came right after the Demon Hunter tour in in summer oh, two thousand six. Okay. So I don't think we were in the school bus then, but yeah, it's two thousand six, and yeah, you're right. The Australian guys in Parkway Drive, like they were super cut and everything, you know. Oh, they were. Sure. I mean, they were they were really really good at what they did. But I just remember at the time, you know, they. It, I think I, that I would really like to research this, but I think that may have been their very first U.S. tour. And um, they played first. They played before us. Correct. And. Yeah. So anyway, that's uh, to me. I just think that's funny because here we are in 2022, and they're just absolutely monstrously huge. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure it's all the same guys. I don't know that they've had a lot of uh, changeover. So, um, kudos to them. Yeah. So we had a school bus, and that didn't work out. Um, as it turns out, the only vehicle we had that worked out for a long period of time was the school bus, or was was Duck's vehicle that, for whatever reason. We just got, he got, I guess he sold it. He got rid of it. And then we were left hunting for vehicles, which did not work out good for at least a five year span. I feel like we were, we were bouncing yeah. back and forth. We had a school bus. We had a, didn't at one point, didn't we like get a red minivan that just got us home or something? Yeah. So on a 2006 <laughs> tour with Alex and Nick as our merch guy, uh, the van we had, we called it Al Sharpton, big purple <laughs> van. And it broke in Oregon and we had to have it towed and we left it there and we bought, yeah, a little red, uh, Chrysler minivan. Was it, we was it a Chrysler? It, yeah. We called it Molly Ringwald and we, right. uh, we rode Molly Ringwald all the way, uh, back home from that tour. And that was probably 2006 or seven. We had like problem after problem. And then we rented for a long time. Right. That's well, that was when we discovered <laughs> that. Uh, unlike other bands who just invested in a good vehicle when they started, um, we were losing so much money over the first few vehicles that we just were like, well, you know what? Why don't we just rent? <laughs> and that'll be way cheaper. And um, I guess at the time it was. Now it's not. Um, nowadays, renting a car is absurd. But um, It can be. But man, it was, you know, between the, the loss, the, the money we paid out for vehicles and then lost them and then had to buy something just to get home and sell. And then ordering merch that we didn't sell on tours that were kind of bust. I remember we built up a sizable debt. I mean, we were like 25 grand in debt as a band at one point, like probably late 2006. 
Yeah. As we're going into record physics of fire. <laughs> right. Totally. Which, um, <clears throat> which is, uh, so you, something you said just triggered, um, just so people know that we didn't plan any of what we're talking about. Literally, you just reminded me. So you said all the merch, buying merch. To me, one of the stories that I've told people that's so fun is when we were on the tour with Demon Hunter. And was it, was it, it, it was within the first few nights. Was it the first night that we sold out or was it after a few nights? I think it was after a few nights. So we drove all up. We started in Oregon. Mm -hmm. and played in the portland area and that was a good show but then i think we sold out in like san francisco or somewhere like the second maybe the second night of the tour and uh, yeah and go go ahead and tell your story because it's great yeah. it's a good one. so so we sold out uh, at least to the point that we didn't really have any t-shirts left to sell people and um so we went to what did we go to a michael's or uh, somewhere like a michael's I don't know that I I don't know that Hobby Lobby was a thing at least out there, um, so we went to Michael's or whatever it was and Joanne Fabrics or something and bought a bunch of black T-shirts, just generic black T-shirts, um, and some stencils and some fabric spray paint, right? Gold and silver. Yeah. We got we got two colors because we, you know, we wanted to give some diversity to people, give some people some options. And we created uh, some black BTA stencil shirts that we spray painted. And I did we sell those in California? Like in yeah, like... that was San Diego. That was before the San Diego show. Show we uh, we yeah. sat outside just like spray painting B the stencil BTA and then signing it and silver autographed them. Party. Yeah, autographed yeah. autographed the shirts. I I have one of those somewhere in a um, size youth large that's somewhere in somewhere in my house. And I've thought that we should probably frame that because of all the things that we did, that's probably one of the, it's probably one of the most, like most uplifting sort of like cool stories that, you know, first of all, that we had the problem that we sold all the merchandise, which just goes to speak of the fact that we had no idea what we were doing. Like we, we had toured a, f a few times before that, but we had never been on a real tour. We'd never been on a tour with uh, somebody who was, you know, packing out the venue and yeah. um that was demon hunters the triptych tour i think yep. Um, yep which of course i think still goes down for all of us as like our favorite record because it's really hard to tour with a band and not fall in love with whatever they're playing at the time i think because it just sort of you earn respect for them and you hear it every night and um okay. but yeah so but then of the fact that we people bought people legitimately bought these bta spray painted shirts we sold them i mean almost all of them I, I know that we had a few left over at the very very end but uh that to me is is crazy and it kept us afloat until the guys at uh belly acres in chicago um were able to get us another shipment of we had to, i mean yeah we're ordering like you know ten thousand dollars worth of shirts and having them overnighted to the next show and and trying to call that promoter say like listen it's going to be delivered to the venue don't let them sit outside on the curb you know like bring them in but like that man, the tour was like not only the best for like turnouts and everything, but like we had the best spot playing first out of those five bands because we got to do our sound check before everybody got in. Right. And then everybody's in. You got 2,000 people in this hot, sweaty room and the smoke is up. And we walk on stage and I started playing the keyboard part for the Epigon. Yep. And then you would scream at everybody coming in. And everybody's like, yeah, you know, and you like you got all of that. It was def yeah, feel. it definitely was a great intro moment for to of the band to a lot of people and i still to this day i'm sure you get the same thing a lot of people will tell me well that's when i discovered that i saw you guys on that tour with demon hunter so um and there were which, so which, many people there's so many people on the show sometimes we actually had to start before everyone got in i was about to say that line. i was about to say the same thing i was about to say almost all of the shows we got to play for the whole crowd but one of the shows where it was the worst where we didn't get to play for hardly anyone was in our hometown in Atlanta and the and the one show where Ryan Clark was willing to come out and do the ga the guest vocals um there were still like 200 people outside waiting to yeah. get in and we're playing at the masquerade the old masquerade so um yeah. so yeah I didn't get the full effect at the masquerade but there's I think there is video on YouTube of Ryan doing his Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. his guest vocal part which is and we yeah. we played three songs and that was with the shortened elegy 
So we're right. playing really only two and a half songs because we had 15 minutes and then there was a five minute set change before August Burns Red started. I mean, that's, you know, it was super tight. But uh, <laughs> dude, one of the craziest stories I remember for that is I talked to Yogi who had just joined uh, Demon Hunter at the time on drums. And he told me, um, he said, yeah, that's one of my favorite tours I've ever done too. And he said, I remember Dallas um, and at that show. It was like a capacity max capacity like two or 1800 or something but they fit like 2500 people in there so it's over fire code and he said it was so hot this is summer you know so summer in dallas so so hot and so humid we went on to play and i couldn't catch my breath he's yeah. like i don't know how i didn't like actually literally pass out and fall off my drum stool because i couldn't i couldn't breathe and get like air into my lungs because it was so wet and dense and hot and so like those first couple songs I was literally just trying to hit the snare in time so that, so that right. the band could stay on, you know, tempo because I couldn't play anything else because I couldn't breathe. I mean, that's how yeah. crazy it was. hundred Well, and that remind that makes me immediately think of playing cornerstone and stuff, all those, all those times. Um, and just how absurdly hot it would be when we would get up there. Um, I can't remember which stage it was, but one of the stages was at the HM stage or something would have fans that would blow on you. And it was, it was like the greatest place to play at Cornerstone <laughs> because everything else was the, the absolute hottest and worst. But uh, we could and talk. You remember- we, yeah, we could talk about Cornerstone and people would probably remember some people have been there. But like that was a whole other universe, honestly, in its own right that has not been replicated. And I don't know that it could be replicated. I don't know that anything like that actually exi- has existed in any other space as far as um you know I, there's obviously humongous there's there's Lollapalooza and people remember that they were at Lollapalooza or Woodstock or you know the, the people have memories of yeah I was at Woodstock or whatever um but I don't know if people have the same I, I would just have to ask have the same memory of the camaraderie that people at Cornerstone I just feel like it was just because there was there was a faith in common at least assumed there was a faith in common. There was a subculture in common. There was the music in common. And then it was just like, we're all going to go to this place that none of us are from because nobody, right. nobody's from Bushnell, Illinois. And we're just, uh, we're just going to go and be there and just be nasty and stuff for a week. And it was, it was such a great thing. And there's nothing else to do there, you know, so right. you're kind of just at the festival all the time. And Except you know, get on just- the party barge and get the red face. <laughs> yeah like as, used to say. as the showdown would uh happily remind us i mean it was such a big deal that um not only did uh the remnant get seen by ryan clark there but also when terminate damnation was coming out our first album they printed those two song samplers just so we would have something at cornerstone to, to totally. spread the word because the album wasn't out yet and if we didn't have a two song sampler people weren't going to hear what we sounded like. I mean, that was how big it was. You put out releases just for corners. What's uh, what songs was on that? I don't remember. Uh, Elegy and beyond adaptation. So we went the longest song and the shortest song from the record. <laughs> Actually, I think it's the longest and shortest songs we ever did. <laughs> What's what? Well, other than necrotizing fasciitis, maybe. Um, but maybe. what's, what's funny about that is I can, I can remember back then i guess there was no there was no spotify there was no streaming economy so for a band like becoming the archetype there was no discussion of singles or what songs are going to be pushed to radio that was like there's no radio for this although there was satellite radio and i do think we occasionally got some songs on like octane or whatever that the heavy metal thing is um people would send people would send uh pictures or whatever but what i think is funny about that is I do remember there used to be something back then called the HXC boards online, the uh, like the hardcore music chat rooms or whatever. And I think the very first song that I ever went to the HXC boards with to try to promote was Elegy. And it was like, this is, this is us. Here we are in all of our, in all of our glory. And it's just, I think there's a certain thing about that. That is what people loved about bta at the beginning because there was nobody on i mean there were huge legendary bands on solid state but there was nobody writing 12 minute long with 
five minutes of piano in the middle. <laughs> it's probably not five minutes, but close. Yeah, feels like feels like an eternity. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> well, it was a, yeah, it was a long song, and that album had no singing, which at the time was the was the was counterculture, right? So like at the time, Under Oath and Dead Poetic and demon hunter are all like the biggest bands on solid state and they'll have kind of a healthy amount of singing and we were like well we don't want to do that we would just want to be an all screaming band Mm -hmm. um and uh you know a lot of blast beats and double kick and that was long songs like that with with that's why we're all very rich (laughs) (laughs) it's yeah yeah that's why that's why we're all very very rich now because we made all the right musical decisions and (laughs) well to be honest like i you know i guess we would have said like we didn't want to envision ourselves as making any money from it we wanted to do what we want to do and we just wanted to i think we would have said we wanted to make a living which we never did that either so (laughs) it was like you came home from tour and you delivered pizzas for a few weeks until you left on tour again 100 percent, yeah delivered pizzas or worked at a hot tub shop at one point and <laughs> did you <laughs> uh it was an outdoor store um george georgia oh backyard. i remember that down at, by uh, the, mall. the mall yep at the mall <laughs> but yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so i mean there's a million stories we could talk about okay so but but i feel like we gotta we need to pick like a, a, a like a big closer now um to use a baseball term here we need someone to close come in a story to come in and really like lock down the victory here So, um, I will give you your pick. Okay. Um, we can either talk about what happened with outside of Baltimore with the sleeping bag. Yeah, that was a good story. Or we can talk about what happened on the ride home from, where was it? The ride home from Wisconsin, where you were driving and got a little, a little tired. extra tired. <laughs> yeah. Which of those would you like to indulge for people? <laughs> well, as a story, either of those could work. Did you want to, should we touch on dichotomy briefly before we, before we go to those? You're thinking very deeply about, uh, about the linear format of this. Uh, d- I mean, dichotomy takes us into so many stories. I know. I know. Because we get into things with Devin and we get into, be, Lopez. Be, being in Canada and yeah. all, all of those things that I think we'll just stick to a tour story for now. Okay. And, uh, and we'll go, we'll close it with that. So, I mean, I think the Baltimore one's probably, probably a better story, right? Sure. And I kind of, here's how I kind of think I would want to do this. I think this is kind of how we've done a lot of them. I'm curious to know how many of the details of this story that I've told a million times I have exaggerated. Okay, so, all right, you tell it, and then I'll. I'll, I'll tell it. <clears throat> so I'm just I'll go piece by piece, and then you can tell me, you know, fill in the other things. Okay. But I, I I remember that it was outside of Baltimore. Mm-hmm. That part correct? Yeah. Okay, got it. We were outside of Baltimore, um, stuck in horrible traffic. Traffic was at least bad enough that we were in park. Yeah. Like we were not moving. Uh, people, other people were getting out of their cars and stuff around us. Like it was, I don't know if, I don't know if I act distinctly remember someone like having a grill in the back of their car or <laughs> if I have made that part up, but I don't remember that, but I'm, it might have <clears throat> happened. It makes the story more fun. There was a guy like cooking hamburgers in the back of his car or something, <laughs> but, um, but we were, we were definitely in traffic for a long time. Now I think in my mind, it was hours, but it probably wasn't hours. It was probably, I don't know, something. But Baltimore traffic, minutes. Baltimore traffic, because of Baltimore and DC, is especially bad, right? Yeah, yeah. Like if you know, it's like if there was two Atlantas next to each other, um, or something. Yeah. I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to compare it to LA because LA is its own animal, terrible animal. Okay. But uh, okay, so. We, I be- also believe this is part of the story. Maybe I've made up. We were all extremely tired from driving on the road. And so we thought that it was hilarious when Daniel was in his sleeping bag and he pulled the sleeping bag up over his head. So that he was like a, 
I, I remember the sleeping bag being blue mm-hmm. and him being like a blue blob in the van bouncing on the seat in in the middle of the van. It's like a cocoon or a, a silkworm or something right. just wiggling around. <laughs> yeah. And I remember that I remember that being funny because I at least the way I remember it, we were so unbelievably tired that it was just hilarious. And you were in the passenger. You were in the passenger seat. I was driving. Uh, and I had the idea to that you should take Daniel and put him on your shoulder and carry him up to the van in front of us, which was uh, driven by onward to Olympus. Uh, awesome guys that we toured with. If I had to make a list of the bands we toured with the most, I feel like we toured with The Showdown, War of Ages, Onward to Olympus, mo- all of those bands multiple times. Uh, Plea, yep. for Pur- Plea for Purging, I think we toured with several yep. times. And um, Inhale, Exhale, I think we toured with yep. all those bands multiple times. Yep. So anyway, good friends, Onward to Olympus. And I propose that you should pick Daniel up and take him up and throw him into their van. Now I'll let you tell what happened after that. And let yeah, and let them thrash around and wreak havoc, right? <laughs> yeah, so of course. I say I say yeah, this is because that's what we do. We say this is a good idea when it's probably not a good idea. <laughs> um, so we're stopped, and you think you're going nowhere. So I'm like, all right. I open my door, I hop out of the passenger seat, open the side doors of the 15 passenger van, and start to grab Daniel in his sleeping bag from the thing. He's not. I don't think he zipped it over his head though, because that's a key part of the what what happened oh, okay well but really quick for anyone who doesn't know we're talking about daniel gailey who is currently in fit for a king and phineas mm-hmm. was mm-hmm. in becoming Pretty... the archetype was in becoming the archetype with us for several tours um but two only albums yeah, yeah. Two, two two albums one album that i was on and one album after i left but he was actually with the band touring and stuff for a good amount of time yeah like three so, years or something okay um, so that's daniel yeah, so we uh, so Duck is in the back air drummer, and so Duck uh, grabs his feet, and I grab his shoulders, and we're going to carry him together. But then, lo and behold, sleeping bags are really slick when you're trying to like pick a body up. So like he slipped out of my hands and like hit his back on the steps going up, which was probably really painful for him. Mm-hmm. And his head popped out with his he had you know hair that was maybe like this long or whatever. And uh, and and about that time, traffic started moving. So you're like, uh, guys, we got, we're, we're going, we got to go. So I like yeah, tried to pick him up. So his head wasn't scraping on the concrete because he can't get his arms and stuff out because they're zipped up in the sleeping bag. <laughs> and I'm running beside the van, you know, like running, trying to keep his head off the ground so that we can move. And finally. Okay. So hold on. So that, okay. so I, I'm glad that you said it that way, because I have told the story that I don't know why whether it's in st- and this is why I, I don't think it could have been that long that it couldn't have been hours that we were there because somehow or other i just instinctively started the van rolling do you remember yeah. that so we weren't sitting still for some reason which to me seems like the silliest thing i'm like okay we'll let them get back in the car obviously <laughs> but somehow or other the okay i was trying to make sure i was like man i think i maybe i've exaggerated that to make it more dramatic but you guys were actually running but bes- you were running beside the car trying to get this blue body Blob bag this body bag back into the van yeah uh, yeah okay. and so we finally do we finally get them pushed back in we're laughing really hard we close the doors and i jump back in the passenger seat and that's when you you were like guys some people were looking at us really weird <laughs> and i saw someone get on their phone do you remember that oh yeah oh yeah yeah so you're like, you know, I, that I, some people were really weirded out by that. And we didn't think anything of it. And then like pretty shortly after that, we passed troopers on. So we're in the all the way left hand lane. Not going and very we, fast. Not going very fast. Yeah. Well, like two miles an hour or stop. Yeah. And then we pass these two troopers, cop cars sitting on the, in the median or on the shoulder. And once we pass them, they turn their lights on and start following us. So we did they, did they okay did they follow us or did we just literally pull over that's the part no, they I, they fall, they got in okay. they turned okay. their lights on got in and then so yeah that's when you pulled over and i'm like i don't understand what we could have done like there's yeah. we're not speeding obviously we're not nothing's happening and what are they and onward to olympus pulled over with us because they didn't know what was going on yeah that's right they saw this good friends they saw in the rearview mirror that we got pulled over and they pulled over as well yeah right which is funny because they had no idea what we had tried to do oh no, yeah <laughs> right, right they did they, they, not, they weren't pulling over with us because they were like oh oh we'll explain it was just a prank like they didn't 
they just pulled over just because, oh, well, they're getting pulled over. I guess let's make sure they're okay or something, you know? Yeah. Um, so for, that, so yeah. I'll let you say what, what the cop does next. <laughs> okay. So what I recall is that at least a couple people in the back were like Duck and Daniel were basically laying down in the back of the van and you and I were in the front and I fully would have expected that what, what was going to happen was that we were going to get a ticket for playing on the side of the road. So I think that's what we all thought was going to happen. So I look into the rearview mirror expecting to see, you know, like a state trooper with a pad and or something. And what I see, I turn back to you guys and I say very calmly, I believe in my recollection, frankly, I believe I said it very calm. Um, <laughs> I believe I said very calmly, they've got their guns out. <laughs> <laughs> I believe those were the exact words. At least every time I've told this story, it's they got they've got their guns out, and you guys, I think that's right. and you guys were like, "What?" Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, and I things escalated very quickly from there to the point well, he, that yeah. Well, hold on. So he so after you said that, it was like right after that. Do you hear him? He whapped his hand. Right. On that's the what trailer. they started hitting the sides of the whap, trailer. Whap, whap. And he's like, "Come out of the effing van with your effing hands in the air!" And we we're like, "Oh my, what is going on right, right now?" Hundred you know? percent. Yeah, they. <laughs> I they, think that's when we started like trembling, and we're like, "Uh oh, this is going to be really bad." Yeah. So the trailer, this big hollow metal like speaker box behind us they're banging on it so it's very loud and then they're banging on the sides of the van and it's very loud i mean they definitely nailed the intimidation uh factor with us because i can i mean i actually if i close my eyes and try to remember the moment it feels like one of the most terrifying moments of my life and so so at that point we did not have we did not have a fancy like soccer mom van where i could open both sides of the van doors i had we had a van where you guys all had to get out one side and i had to get out by myself on the on the driver's side so you guys are all getting out to the shoulder this nice wonderful no no, no you were on the you were on the shoulder we had to get out into the next lane because we we're on the left hand okay. lane well when i say when i say shoulder what i mean is you guys had a paved area i stepped yeah. down into tall grass and and <laughs> When I got out of the out of out of the van, there was immediately a gun pointed in my face, and he was screaming, and just like you said, he was screaming, "Get on the ground, or I'll blow your effing head off." And so, of course, of course, since I'm very athletic and very quick, I got down very, I got down on my face, and then and then there's just bodies running around the vehicle boots clapping around the vehicle screaming where's the girl where's the girl so and this is what so yeah they did the same on our side but i don't i didn't get a gun actually pointed at my head but daniel did for some reason they clasped daniel on the shoulder and put the gun to his temple and were like face down on the ground and like followed him with the gun on his head all the wow. way until his nose was on the pavement and i you know i went down and got down and yeah and then they started saying what you're saying where's the girl right and i if i if i'm not wrong i believe they went up and searched onward to olympus's van as well because they were they were with us but i i don't i don't i don't know that they did a thorough search I don't or if they just that. i felt like they they checked with them but Some all of my all to olympus walked back after a okay while. Maybe that, but all of my details are fuzzy because i was laying in the grass by myself <laughs> yeah so so over on our <clears> side we're all face down and I, I start saying you know what we don't have any girls we're just four guys in the band and so the guy comes and picks me up and he says, we got a call from someone that said, you guys, this van had abduct abducted a girl and they tried to escape and you shut her back in. And that then everything clicks. I remember right. you saying someone looked concerned and it made a call. Mm -hmm. So someone had seen that they'd seen Daniel's long floppy hair and thought that's a girl mm -hmm. and that they had tried to escape. So, oh, oh, now, so I explained to him, it's all a joke. You know, we're going to do this joke. That's another band. We're on tour with them. Right. They vouch for us. So we're all laughing and Duck and Daniel get off the ground and we're standing and we're <laughs> laughing. And the guy from uh, Honor to Olympus is laughing and we all have a good laugh. And it's like five minutes long. And I'm like, where's Jason? <laughs> and we walk around and you're still like face down in like the waist of the high grass. <laughs> Why would I have no moved? No one have told you. Yeah, no Why one would have told moved? you like it's and resolved. And what's uh, 
I have every time I've told this story, I have said how how fortunate are we that we were all just a bunch of sweaty, smelly dudes who did not have like a girlfriend or something with us because a lot of bands toured with their girlfriends or their wives or they have a merchandise person who if yeah. if there had been a girl with us in any capacity, I feel like we would have been taken to jail, like at least for questioning, because they <laughs> yeah. they certainly would not have believed the story that, oh, no, no, it was just a prank. They would have been like, well, they must have told her to say that or something. Right. Um, so, yeah, we were very fortunate that we were losers. Um, <laughs> we were in, fortunate to be losers. In that moment, we were fortunate to be a traveling Dungeons and Dragons nerd party. Um <laughs> where we didn't we didn't get in trouble and that so that's the craziest part is i mean i don't recall we didn't i don't think we got in trouble right we they just no, they no basically tickets. they basically were just like okay well don't be bozos um and i to close the story i recall there being something about another trooper pulls up and the other troopers who were with us actually tell us oh well this guy uh, this guy's a you know he's a tool or whatever and he steps out and he legitimately has the like the aviators and the big brimmed hat and comes oh, up and's like, what's it, what seems to be the problem here, fellas? And like, I, I don't know if that part actually happened or if that, it was some movie that I saw. Um, <laughs> I think you're right, though. I think you're right. But it was yeah. it was one of those things. Now, <clears throat> this is and I'll, I'll let you go short in just a second. But I get this story. So we won't tell this whole other story, but I get this one mixed up with. I think there were multiple, at, at least two occasions where we got pulled over and the result was that the police officer either knew who we were, which I think happened one time, or no, he didn't know who we were. He knew who like Extol or someone was. That was on the Extol tour, our second forever in California on I-5. And it was a young cop, like in his 30s. And uh -huh. I was wearing the Undeceived shirt and I was driving. And he was, I was like, yeah, we're, we're a band. We're on tour with this band right here. And he's like, I love Extol, man. And I was like, right on. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then the other one was, I feel like we got pulled over at one point and we told the guy we were a band and a, a Christian rock band or something. And he said, Oh, like POD. And I think we said, Oh yeah, yeah. Like, like POD. And I think he ended up like, I think we ended up giving him a CD. I think in both, <laughs> I think in both of those cases, I remember us giving the police officer a CD. So yeah, that's I, probably true. I don't actually, I guess what I'm saying is we didn't have nothing like that happened with the guys in Baltimore. I don't think did it. No, no. It honey, just basically let us go it. because. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Cool. Well, yeah. sweet, man. <laughs> Well, we could probably do this forever and it, it, uh, I hope it'll be fun. And it seems like you've almost got like this, like the darkness has settled upon your house or something. <laughs> so over the course of the interview, you've gone from, it's almost like a Hollywood thing. You've gone from very well lit to like very darkly, like vampiric Count Seth of old kind of thing. Uh, I'm becoming the Lord of Death once again. Yep becoming the archetype of death so <laughs> hey, man well i appreciate it thank you so much for talking with me yeah thanks for having uh, me on jason